Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, this course on ecology and society uh, is being designed in such a way that uh, we are able to uh, contextualize the debate, the growing, as we all are aware the, about the ecological crisis which we are facing uh, in almost every country and, uh, and there has been an increasing uh, <clears throat> concerned about the ecological problems which we have and even in the global forum and uh, even at the regional level these are being addressed. Now uh, in this course uh, I would like you to have uh, a look at uh, how we do go about the course and in a sense the aims and objectives if not the preamble of the course. Now, this course will uh, primarily focuses on the cultural uh, ecology uh, and uh, the relationship between human and environment relationship that is uh, by basing on some of the anthropological works which has been uh, done over the past few decades. And uh, mostly why is this ecology and society uh, given so much of importance is because uh, it tries to address and look at how societies tries to connect between ecology and human social cultural and organizational processes. So in the course of this there is an increasing need to uh, contextualize and uh, make a debate trying to find out the deeper meanings of how we humans try to perceive not just the environment but the overall relationship that exists between uh, different forms of uh, <clears throat> life system or the ecosystem in general that is biotic and non-biotic. Now I will be trying to as I said I will be trying to uh, be very specific and tries to uh, look at some of the selected ecological anthropologies works in, and, and in this course the focuses will be primarily on human cultures and their ecological environment and some of the concepts which is uh, widely used in uh, anthropology such as culture, the kind of belief system which uh, people have for instance the indigenous peoples they have possessed for, the, uh, for generations and how are these uh, knowledge systems to be uh, understood because unless uh, a deeper understanding of this knowledge system is explored, it is difficult to address uh, some of the problems which are normally encountered simply because if you look at the debate on uh, development, why is development being questioned today is simply because the often times the indigenous peoples are the most vulnerable and the most affected and why is this so? So in, in view of this one needs to look at the kind of uh, relationship, the kind of uh, connections which uh, these 
societies have with nature. Now, as Latour says, society and culture or society and nature has to be uh, given much more uh, importance and it should be understood uh, in order to make sense of the world eco ecosystem. And moving on, some of uh, I am trying to now uh, give an explanation about uh, sort of a brief background of how uh, the need to bring in uh, society in the context of the debate which revolves around the ecological crisis. Now, if you look around, the society cannot be afford to be seen in isolation from nature because it is society which has uh, over generations have evolved over time. If you look at the evolution of human society beginning from uh, say the food gathering or hunting society and moving on to the uh, agriculture or feudal society and to industrial society. In this evolution of society, human societies have evolved themselves and in this evolution, uh, the relationship between human and nature also changes. Now, if we are trying to bring in, for instance, the uh, concept of sustainability, how do we understand or which part or which section of the society or which period of the society have sustainably uh, used their resources in a more sustainable manner. Now, for all this to have uh, an answer, we will try to look into some of the uh, ecological anthropological works uh, we, or based on case studies in different societies and try to look at how these uh, traditional ecological knowledge have been used by people over generations. Now, for instance, uh, if a part of society changes, it is tantamount that other parts also will be changing. And uh, for instance, if you take the example, uh, look into institutions such as family, which cannot be afford to be uh, talked and looked into isolation, because the economic, uh, political or religious institutions of a society are more or less interwoven and uh, interrelated. We cannot afford to, you know, like, see things only from an economic perspective or for that matter the state uh, or the markets or development way of looking at things that is the whole idea of utilitarian perspective. Now we need to bring in other issues uh, such as the socio-cultural and religious dimensions in order to have a much more holistic approach in understanding ecology and thereby how ecology and societies are interrelated. And moving on, how do we look at society? How, how, how do we try to see society in a more uh, holistic way? Society needs to be uh, looked at by taking into the interrelated parts uh, which actually forms the core of most social theories. Now, for example, if you take the uh, organismic theory of Herbert Spencer, for example, it talks about the interrelationship of the parts of human's body. and 
based on this we can also contextualize that uh, the manner in which societies evolve over time it, it actually grows up and but one thing which we should differentiate between the organismic, organismic understanding of society and what uh, the society as it evolves. The more society uh, grows up, there has, it, has, it becomes more and more complex and this complexity in some way tends to make society as defragmented and we tends to be more guided by our own self interest and that is how uh, society uh, is to be differentiated from the human parts of the body by sort of like looking at uh, Herbert Spencer's uh, understanding of organismic theory of, theory of society. Now, we should also accept the fact that there is a difference in terms of organizing principles and the way society is organized and some of these organizations are mostly to determine the needs of uh, the rest of the system that is we humans have different needs, different stages of needs. Most, some of the basic needs are food, shelter and also uh, as a human being we have multiple forms of needs and we tend to uh, prioritize our needs keeping in mind the basic needs like food, shelter for instance and we move on by trying to find deeper meanings of our needs and perhaps with the ecological crisis or the environmental crisis which we are facing presently. Some of the philosophers like uh, Norwegian philosopher like Arne Nest by trying to conceptualize the term called deep ecology tries to ask much more deeper meanings of life that is what he puts it uh, in short that to make sense of the environment or the ecological crisis one needs to have that self realization that is self realization is nothing but to engage in questioning deeper meanings of our existence. And of course, I am going to discuss uh, in more details about deep ecology in a uh, future upcoming uh, discussion. Now, as I was talking about what are the kind of uh, needs we human have. Human or mankind is re relatively free from biological instincts, drives and predispositions unlike our uh, uh, fellow uh, beings like animals and so on and so forth. Humans rather rely on instincts that is we are much more reflexive by saying so I am not saying that the animals are not reflexive, but we have instincts which are more or less based on subjectivity where we can really think about uh, the pros and cons, judge between what is good, what is bad and many of much of our behavior is learned through the process of socialization. Now, why is this human socialization important in the context of ecology. Now, for instance, uh, Murray Bookchin talk about social ecology and in social ecology he also talks about the domination and hierarchy of nature. 
Now, what he discussed in social ecology was humans through a socialization process tends to have that kind of innate behavior and this socialization is very important and crucial in order to have a perception and attitude towards nature. Now, in the course of uh, how society evolves, there is certain sections of uh, groups who tends to dominate the other groups and often times these dominant groups are a few sections of people and these few sections of people also replicate in terms of the society and uh, ecological relationship it's which we have. For instance, if you take the case of a capitalist society, how many how many sections of the society act actually profit from the capitalist system? Marx has talks about uh, those uh, capitalists that is the bourgeois society which are actually a handful of them which happens to exploit the proletariat those working class and by exploiting those working class uh, the bourgeois were in a way making sort of uh, taking advantage or profit by exploiting or at the cost of the working class. Now, similarly, if you take capitalism or Marx understanding of capitalism as a perspective of looking at the relationship between human and nature or society and nature, it is pretty much evident that uh, it is only few section of the society which actually uh, exploit or make use of the resources and at the cause of these few people's interest. There are a lot of people like who have been uh, exploited and have undergoes different kinds of sufferings. For instance, human uh, development induced displacement. Like for instance, uh, when a dam is being built, the environmental impact is enormous and environmental impact needs to be situated in the cultural and uh, economic uh, perspective because there are communities who have actually been dependent on uh, that geographical space for generations. And when these communities who has been so much dependent on uh, the natural resources in their surrounding or in their environment are being affected and being displaced, we tends to become more vulnerable and their means of uh, the, not only their means of livelihood are disrupted, but even their social and cultural if not religious attachment to that geographical space or geographical niche is uh, being uh, put into problem. Now, the reason why I am saying and discussing all this is because uh, we, we humans, as we know, have are guided by our certain kinds of instincts. And we also agreed that the behavior which we have is learned through different kind of uh, socialization process beginning from the infancy and uh, through the institutions of family and through these socializations our belief, our ideas, our perspective, our outlook is being 
shape and designed. Now, why do we need to focus looking at human needs? The reason being that is the kind of uh, crisis which we are facing now globally and even in the regional context are, most, are mostly because humans urge and yearn or quest for things beyond the human's basic needs. Now, I quote uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he says that the world has enough resources to meet the needs of mankind, but not, to, not sufficient enough to meet the needs of humans' uh, greed and selfishness. Now, in this context, we can perhaps look at what actually is human needs. And are we really uh, focusing on our basic needs? or are we being influenced by certain uh, factors or things happening around us. Perhaps maybe the uh, Western uh, values or maybe the Western industrial uh, cultures. Are we able to sustain ourselves by looking at these needs? Do we really sustain ourselves with the resources which we have right now with us? Therefore, it is vital for us to be concerned and ask ourselves as uh, Norwegian philosopher Ernest Ness talks about by asking deeper meanings. Now, there is also an increasing awareness which arises out of our capacity as a human beings that is the need uh, which evolve not just around us a means of livelihood but the quest to fulfill different other needs for instance you can take example to religions or maybe let's say philosophy or maybe different forms of uh, paradigm. Now, for instance, if you take the examples of Gautam Buddha, he renounced worldly pleasures and the material possessions of life. And his quest or yarn for, for him was much more uh, deeper meanings in life. That is nothing but the enlightenment and uh, as we all know like the life of Gautam Buddha, he was uh, in exile in the forest for, for a brief period of years and then finally he attained that enlightenment. Uh, what we can reflect perhaps from Buddha or the Buddhist principles of perceiving nature is we need to have that caring and nurturing nurturance of nature that is the resources has to be utilized and uh, exploited for our to satisfy our basic needs and not beyond it now in the upcoming lectures on this course, we would also be discussing some of the religious philosophy, which actually talks about how in different parts of the world, some societies are more close to nature through their religious and uh, cultural beliefs. Now, mostly uh, the Eastern religious traditions are considered to be much more closer to, uh, more harmonious to, uh, in terms of sharing the relationship. And uh, whereas, if you take the 
examples of lean white uh, argument of how and why he brought in the Judeo Christian religions to be in some way responsible for the ecological crisis which we face now. Now, if you looked at Lynn White's argument, which of course I will come up uh, in more details in the upcoming classes, I am just giving you a brief introduction of how religion in some way the belief and practices of uh, mankind is also responsible for the kind of problems which we are facing today. The Judeo Christian religions is considered to be more anthropocentric. By saying anthropocentric, I mean to say that there is a belief which says human being as above all the other ecosystem or nature. And humans seem to be the center of this ecosystem and which in some way is being perceived to have overriding powers or authority to use and exploit the other forms of uh, life if not ecosystem both biotic and non-biotic. Now, this kind of perceptions which are more or less within the frame of anthropocentric is pretty much being synonymized to the Christian way of perceiving things. I will cite a few case studies on how with the uh, conversion to Christianity mostly in the, the northeast region uh, some indigenous communities and uh, which I am part of this region have actually encounter the kind of uh, shift in this belief. Uh, many of the indigenous communities of this region have actually uh, converted to Christianity begin, uh, beginning from the later part of the 19th century and mostly in the early 20th century. And in, in, in this, if you look at the kind of changes, not just religiously, socially, culturally, but the understanding on the way of perceiving environment has totally changed as a result of this conversion to Christianity. Because many of these uh, communities or societies uh, before the uh, pre conversion to these by these uh, Christian missionaries, they practice their own uh, traditional religions mostly animistic and some even uh, follow the totemism. Now, this kind of indigenous knowledge if uh, we revisit and looked at, they tend to uh, perceive nature in a more sacred or with reverence at least. Even like uh, looking at the agriculture practices, they tend to follow different kinds of rituals and ceremonies which have been practiced uh, over the past generations and which actually is seen to be much more in harmonious or sort of a symbiotic relationship which they share with uh, the natural environment which they have inhabited. Now, or maybe if you take the examples of a hunting, before any kind of uh, hunting expedition is taken, usually a kind of magic or if not certain rituals are practiced so that only those animals which are deserving to sort of be in the part of the game, the souls are being invited. 
Now, these rituals and ceremonies are nothing but which are being uh, carried out so that there is a balance in the ecosystem so that other animals, if not maybe another forms of lives are not being disrupted or affected. So, in a sense, those practices are to be interpret as much more ecologically balanced and seem to be much more sustainable. Now, why is there an increasing need uh, in terms of uh, focusing on this, the native, the aborigines if not indigenous, if not tribal societies is because there is an increasing realization from uh, different practitioners or different bodies like maybe the scientists, maybe the policy makers, planners, because they feel that science and technology no doubt has made our life much more easier and then whatever we are now in the position is because of science and technology. But science and technology alone is not in a position or able to bring a solution to the kind of uh, ecological problems which we are facing now. Therefore, there is an increasing need that one needs to accommodate and make those communities who have traditional wisdom, traditional knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge to be part of uh, the knowledge society. Now, they have increasingly realized that this, the formal and the informal knowledge has to coexist and only then if these two move alongside parallelly, maybe there will be some way of an alternative way of perceiving things or maybe a solution. Now, let me not uh, go into deep details for the time being, but I am just making a brief overview or understanding of why many of the third world if not indigenous communities are slowly given importance and uh, there is a quest for accommodating them to be part of the sort of development discourse which we are facing now or which we have perhaps encountered in the post-colonial period. Now, I will just give sort of a brief uh, conceptual uh, uh, introduction of which often is seen to be overlapping because in general understanding ecology and environment is seen to be one and the same well which is not the same at all because it is different and also how this development and economic growth has to be interlinked in the context of this sustainable development and how society, nature and culture are interrelated because we cannot leave one and then uh, discuss something else or one cannot be understood in isolation because there is this uh, understanding if it has to be in a holistic approach this uh, should be interrelated and then given much more uh, an idea. Now, what then is ecology? Ecology tries to uh, make sense or understand the relationship of uh, living organisms to one another and to their physical environment. That is how the living organisms are sharing uh, 
that relationship with the physical space they have inhabited. Now, when I say living organism, it also includes the human. And it is interesting to see how human societies uh, for generations have sort of uh, adapt or tries to sustain themselves for with the physical environment they have inhabited. Now, for instance, the climate change which is hotly talked about and debated, if you try to contextualize uh, this climate change uh, within the human societies, it will be interesting to see how different forms of societies or communities in terms of their relationship uh, with uh, natural resources have changed as a result of climate change. And one cannot deny that we humans try to find out different forms of or modes of adaptation in order to uh, make sense of the environment not just for our sustainable or sustenance but also for different aspects like uh, the kind of adjustment which is required on our part. And ecology also refers to the interrela interrelations of human beings, flora, fauna, plants and animals with elements of the natural and the physical environment that is biotic and non-biotic components. Now, that is the kind of uh, relationship which are shared by all the living and even non-living beings in the uh, physical environment which we are into. Now, what then is environment? Environment refers to the surroundings or the context within which humans, animals, plants and other exist. It is the context and not the relationship which means ecology has a much more deeper and wider meaning and we humans live in close interaction with this uh, natural environment that has not only shaped our cultural identity but our value systems as well as economic well-being. Now, you can pick any communities which are not being influenced by their environment. Uh, may it be their identity or maybe the food cultures, food habits or maybe the kind of attires which we normally put on. Now, for example, we know that the North Pole where the Eskimos lived is considered to be pretty cold and they also find a way to adapt to this kind of cold climate and similarly in many tropical countries uh, or maybe who are close to the equatorial region they have uh, adapt themselves and find their own way of uh, living with the weather and the climatic conditions or environment which they have into and uh, which also save not only their cultural identity and values but also their economic well-being. Now for instance, uh, by and again I will give an examples of uh, indigenous communities in the Northeast India region because this is where I have uh, pursued uh, some of my uh, doctoral research and I will time and again try to cite an examples of uh, these communities. 
Now, if you look at the communities here, they have been practicing this uh, sifting cultivation, which is also locally known as zooming. Now, zooming to an outsider's might be just an agriculture, if not economic practices. But there are communities who have uh, not only rituals and ceremonies around it, but zooming to them has become not just a means of sus sustenance, but uh, a way of life, which is much more beyond just a mere economic well-being. Right? Now, by saying so, these economic practices also in some way uh, influences not just the cultural and social practices, but also their way of life. Now, these are something which we need to look at how envir environment also tries to influence or have uh, far reaching uh, impact not only uh, our outward identity, but the inner, inner self that is a way of perceiving or looking at things and the way in which we make sense of what we usually encounter in our life. Right uh, now, these close interactions, uh, which is normally shared by the natural environment uh, and human, has to be uh, contextualized in that uh, case. Now, we all know what ecology and what environment is. Now, if we pose the questions that can we actually survive or live without this environment? Because most often times we all know that we have reached a point where we have uh, sort of uh, disturbed or caused a lot of problems to the environment. And there can be a possibilities of debating of surviving without this environment, maybe virtually not in reality. Because if you looked at some of the science and uh, the films on science and fiction, for example, the movies uh, of this avatar, which was released in 2012. You can actually witness how humans tries to create sort of a virtual world where the humans in the ecosystems are to adapt or to survive even. Now, can we really think of surviving without the environment? which is something uh, is pretty much disturbing and we cannot really in a true sense uh, afford to think of surviving without this environment. Now, what is this context of environment? Why is it so much uh, vital or important for our uh, not just well-being and existence because this environment in association with learning and experience often refers to the sum of outside influence of the organism that is distinguished from the inherited potential that together influence human behavior and development. Now, as we said, environment has to some extent not only shapes our minds and uh, values, but it has a deep impact on uh, the human behavior. 
Now, how do we actually relate uh, to the current this system of fragility? We have often come across a term called ecosystem fragility, right? Now, why is this uh, a problem for us? Because it tends to threaten not just the human technology and development as a result of industrial revolution and with the increasing uh, population of human beings. Now, these factors in a way has posed a threat to the ecosystem and which becomes uh, a fragile uh, landscape whatever we have inhabit. Now, when does this fra uh, fragility of e ecosystem usually happens? When there is a more of a demand and there is a shortage in supply, for instance, uh, say take the example of the carrying capacity of a particular geographical area. If that area or maybe an agricultural land is not able to really uh, meet the requirements or not able to produce uh, what is the desired output, simply then there is an imbalance in, in this supply and demand or demand and supply and vice versa. Now, these are some of the ecosystem fragility which is being encountered in the past few decades, right? You, you can take examples of not just land and forest, you can also take the cases of the sea, marine and different forms of water bodies, right? Now, how do we try to link and make sense of this the animate and inanimate world that is the living and non-livings because sometimes we are under the perception that uh, we don't really the inanimate or non-livings as if it doesn't really uh, matters for us and uh, and and it oftentimes it is being perceived to be uh, having a limitless in the sense it can be exploited to any extent simply because it is inexhaustible. Now, how does one look at these two relationships that is the animate and inanimate. By saying animate we mean to say with uh, the plants and animals which uh, of course includes the humans as well and the inanimate those objects, machines and the physical world around us, right? For instance, from a universalist or market point of view, if a mining is being carried out, it, it, it sees no problems in uh, mining because they are in a way extracting resources which, which, which has more of uh, a value. Now, how do we interpret and make sense of this value? The value has to be not just seen from a uh, utilitarian perspective or it has to be rather seen from a more intrinsic way as well. Because if we tend to see uh, it merely from a util utilitarian value, we will uh, ignore or missed out the real meanings of what is embedded in these inanimate objects. Now, if we try to, you know, like make sense of the animate and inanimate things, one needs to try to contextualize and uh, make sense of what is the relationship usually being uh, shared by these uh, two uh, entities. Now, 
the next question is the first question which we ask ourselves is can we survive without the environment. Now, the second question is can we actually control the environment because we have encountered environmental disasters like maybe uh, earthquakes, floods, industrial existence, uh, accident sorry and which actually highlight that the animation of inanimate matter and do we really have uh, the expertise or the skills to actually control all this environmental disaster because we have come across different uh, disasters and which actually have uh, a, a told on the human society. But the question is are we willing to uh, seek for a deeper meanings or if not see things beyond just the mere uh, utilitarian values. Now, I will try to look at how these the concepts or these levels of study uh, <coughs> will be uh, looked into uh, much before that as I said uh, we often try to look into the whole ecosystem from a very narrow approach that is more which are guided by more market oriented and which often is being sponsored by the state and the development projects which we normally follow is mostly driven by the so called capitalist economy. Now, do we think that this sort of uh, capitalist economy is sustainable? Do we need to look beyond a mere capitalist economy? Uh, for instance, uh, if you looked at uh, some of the problems which are being encountered by the indigenous communities for instance when the sort of development projects are normally being initiated it uh, has sort of a wider implications if not impact on these vulnerable communities because for them the animate and inanimate is more or less the same and they cannot really distinguish between these two entities as separate bodies because they have been for generations been closely associated and live with this environment. Now, as I have been saying, uh, can these people uh, afford to live out of this environment and uh, uh, which has to be understood uh, in the context of this debate or maybe in the debate of uh, environment versus development and if development has to be uh, part of the discourse will this uh, practices be seen as sustainable.